And there we are. All right. All good. All good. All good. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. And whatever other time of the day it may be to all of you out there. Nice to see you. Um, I'm Tad. Still Tad. Always Tad. That's my curse. I wake up every day. Still Tad. Um, but, uh, not complaining, had a nice day today, went, uh, actually got out of the house for a while, went over the hill, meaning in our case, from the coast side over the hills to the Silicon Valley side, um, of the Bay area where we are and, uh, went to the museum at the art museum at Stanford, um, which is called the Cantor museum it used to be the Stanford museum, but, um, it was closed after the 89 quake and then reopened um, and uh, refurbished and all kinds of stuff. And uh, it's it's been very nice ever since. Um, not that there was anything wrong with it particularly before, but it's uh, those of you who read the Bobby Dollar books um, know that I do quite a bit with what used to be the Stanford Museum and is now the Cantor Museum, except that's my dark creepy version of Stanford University. In real life, the Stanford University is much less creepy than that. Um, a very nice place and a very nice museum. So we got to see a lot of cool stuff, both um, a number of things. Um, they have a very nice collection in general, but they also do nice um, exhibits on particular things. Um, Deb and I were both particularly knocked out by a, a Frank Stella, which was just stunningly gorgeous one of those abstracts that just leaps i mean not literally but figuratively just leaps off the wall can't take your eyes off it just amazing and a lot of other beautiful stuff the photography of gordon parks a very famous um african-american or black american photographer um and who later became a director and i other things i didn't know he was also a, a composed music and all kinds of things um amazingly talented guy but his photographs are just stunning and just a lot of cool stuff um so it was really nice to get out and do that and then we went to a restaurant that we literally haven't been to from close since we moved over which was like 2010 2010 2011 so that was good fun too um, we sent a picture of it to our daughter who was you know very young at the time we moved and uh, had never eaten anything at this particular mexican restaurant except chicken nuggets <laughs> but she recognized it instantly when we said yeah guess where we are so that was good fun anyway and i'm plugging away on navigators children um, not much to report as far as that goes, um, except for just working on it, juggling, moving things around, doing all kinds of stuff like that. It seems to be going well, but, you know, one never knows about one's own work. But at least it's going forward again, which, you know, after having a long hiatus for very many reasons, it was um, really, really nice to be doing it. Um, as far as the sound goes, I am now plugged directly into the computer, so I don't know what is going on with that. Um, I could try another microphone, I suppose, but static. I don't know why that should be. It doesn't make any sense. The microphone shouldn't be doing anything like that. Um, Sorry about that. I don't know. It may be the quality of the, the broadcast itself. I mean, it's a it's a really nice professional microphone. Um, I have no idea. Um, so anyway, yeah, crackling sound is strange. Yeah, I don't know why that would be. As I said, I've plugged it directly into the computer. Um, I don't know what I can do short of plugging it into something else. Um, hang on.
And audio. Yes, okay. Don't know. Don't know why it's giving crackling and stuff. Um, unfortunately, the part of the problem is, is that since I've already started the broadcast, unless I, um, <laughs> I'm not swearing, honestly, I'm not. Um, since I'm uh, in the process of m trying to move things around, if I have to do a whole new microphone, apparently I have to start the whole broadcast over. I'm not going to do that. So we're just going to have to live with what we've got, and that's that. Anyway, so sorry for all the confusion. Um, God, I really wish I had. It's like I, my entire career in the in 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 the, the music field we were always complaining about like oh my god we need roadies you know and when i was doing radio i was having to engineer my own shows most of the time except for the short term that when i was working at a professional station but the years and years i spent at the college station I always had to engineer my own shows um i i you know <laughs> it's, it's, i can only do what i can do I'm doing the best I can. Anyway, so you go away, little microphone. We'll figure you out later. Um, I have no idea why microphones are difficult. Um, yeah, no, it's it's in soft focus here because for some reason it's it lost the the focus. Um, who knows? Maybe it's lost the. Uh... No, it's got the webcam, so it's still the webcam. I'll just stay in one place for a while till it finds me again. And uh, which it usually does after a while. I'm trying to think if there's anything else I need to tell you before we go ahead and start reading. I'm just, <laughs> I'm amused, but in a very sad way at having to struggle with all this nonsense. Um, not because I'm complaining about it, just because it's just amazingly ridiculous to have to. In this day and age when everything should just work, you should be able to just plug it in and it should just work. And instead, what do you get? You get this stuff. Anyway, which, by the way, remember, I'm only working with all this stuff in the first place because Facebook was so impossible to work with in terms of trying to do a broadcast. Um, so anyway, what can I say? Okay, let me just check in and say hello. I'm going to have to skip over all the things about the sound, which is about three quarters of the comments. But... I'm going to say hello to people anyway. So first off, who do we got here? Chris, good morning in sunny Lübeck. Nice to see you, Anamika. Good morning. Good to see you too. Mark, good morning. Good morning. I hope it's still nice in Yorkshire. Ronnie, checking in from sunny Scotland. Oh, that's nice to hear. All right, good. I was just uh, thinking about Scotland for various reasons because of some history stuff Deb and I have been watching. Holger says, good morning to all here, and and started Brothers of the Wind. Um, anyway, so good. I hope you enjoy it. Kristen, hello. Good to see you. And Jeremy, good evening, good evening. A pleasure as always. It's still not finding the focus here. All right, come on. You can do it. What's so hard? I'm here. Focus. Focus. God. Um, anyway... Chris, I already said hello to. Oh, as far as the voice recognition stuff, um, I, I certainly have thought about it. The problem is, and because I was just talking to Deb about this today, is I've been going through this stretch of inflammation for several months now. Um, the problem is, is that, you know, I have 35, 40 years now of thinking brain, hands, keyboard. So, um, I could change over, but it's not something I can do in the middle of a book without wanting, you know, it's, it's, if, when I have to change keyboards occasionally, which, you know, like when I go on tour or something and I have to use just my regular laptop instead of the, the special keyboard I use, just using a, a, a keyboard screws me up for a week or two before I can get used to a normal one. So I can't even imagine what changing my whole creative process to try and learn how to dictate and control everything that way. Um, I, I don't want to do it in the middle of a book. So if if I have to go that way at some point, it will be between books. I still don't know why this thing still won't focus. Maybe if I lean back a little bit, it'll start looking for me. I don't know. Uh, almost sounded like Pee Wee Herman there. Um, all right. So who else have I not said hello to yet? Mahmoud. 
Hello, yes, okay, now we're talking about the sound, static sound, crackly sound, Ronnie Kim says no sound, but hi, Kim, anyway. Um, yes, I was mute because I was unplugging, um, <laughs> I was unplugging various cords, trying to find a way that I could make the other microphone work. Um, let's see, who else? Have I said hello to everybody who's checked in? I think so. This is all about the crackling and all that kind of stuff, so... And now the picture's out of focus. Winter, hello, Winter. <laughs> hello, Christina. Lovely to see you, Rosalba. You too. A pleasure, a pleasure, everybody. Ilva, hello. Hi, sweetie. Okay, it seems like I've checked in with everybody. We've done what we could do with the sound. I don't know why the, the, the camera has just suddenly decided it never wants to be in focus again. I don't know why. It's beyond me. Um... Who knows? Not me. Anyway, so I'm about to start reading in just a moment. Um, oh, Jeremy says, the brother too says, hello, hello. Um, and uh, so hello, say hello to your brother. It's always good to see him too, even if he's not actually taking the trouble to sign in, but, but wants to be given credit for being here anyway, I say. Hi, good to see you. Okay, and I, apparently I'm never going to get back into focus. I don't know why. Okay, watch out. This is going to be really scary. Sometimes if you get close or you just stay in one position for a long time, it will actually focus. But that does not appear to be the case. So let's just check one last thing. High definition, 720. Yeah, that's really the only thing I can have there is that particular. Uh, yeah, okay. Now, that's basically everything is set the way it was set all the other times. I give up. I give up. I'm just going to live with it. Uh, everything seems to be plugged in correctly. There's no reason. I mean, there, if you've got a picture, you've got a picture. The non-focusing thing is something else. So it's not the electrical contacts. That might have something to do with the microphone, which I'm back to the original microphone. So if it's crackling, I, I have no idea what's causing it. Maybe we just have bad lines going out from here. I don't know. And frankly, I'm having enough trouble trying to get my telephone fixed here without even trying to figure out why I'm not getting a decent wire Wi-Fi broadcasting connection. So, but I'm going to read, and I will read, and if the crackling is too bad, I can't really do anything about it. I apologize. Um, that's just the way it is. So, okay, where were we? All right, last time, Rini, when I was reading last time, Rini had just come through. Uh, that means she had, after hitching up with uh, Blue Dog Anchorite, whose name is Singh and Martine, and she and Kabu had all been, uh, Blue, Dog was, Blue Dog Anchorite was going to get them back into um, uh, the, uh, whatchamacallit, the um, Otherland, get them into Otherland. And then something very weird and bad happened, um, something not anything like what was expected. And when Rini was conscious, I guess, again, she found herself in the middle of essentially a kind of a normal looking tropical jungle. I mean, as normal looking as a tropical jungle can be when you're not expecting one. Um, which on the scale of expectedness is actually even beyond the Spanish Inquisition in terms of its unexpectedness. So anyway, uh, I'm going to start with that. Rini just having come through, trying to figure out she, Kabu is not apparently there with her. She is a bit nonplussed about this. And um, I've done everything I could, and now I am going to continue. So there we go. Anyway, Rini looked up. The tree shadows had taken on a new angle, and the sky seemed just perceptibly darker. Everything else is just like our L, she thought. So maybe I better start thinking about a fire. Who knows what's going to be walking around here at night? The impossibility of her situation once more threatened to overcome her, but beneath the shock and confusion and despair, there was also a tiny trace of sour humor. 
Who would ever have guessed that her precious, hard-earned college education, a thing that everyone had said would make her an integral part of the 21st century, would instead have led her to building imaginary fires in imaginary jungles to keep imaginary beasts at bay. Congratulations, Srini. You are now an official imaginary primitive. It was hopeless. Even with the trick Kabu had showed her, she could not manufacture a single spark. The wood had been too long on the damp ground. Whoever made this bastard place had to be a stickler for detail, didn't he? Couldn't have left a few dry sticks around. Something rustled in the branches. Rini jerked upright and seized one of the branches, hoping it would make a better club than it had a bonfire. What are you so afraid of? It's a simulation. So some big old leopard or something comes out of the dark and kills you, so what? But that would probably throw her out of the network, game over, which would be another way of failing Sing, Stephen, everyone. And this whole place feels too goddamn real anyway. I don't want to find out how they'd simulate me being something's dinner. The clear place in which she had settled was scarcely three meters wide, the moonlight filtering down through the trees was strong, but it was still only moonlight. Anything big enough to harm her would probably be on her before she could react. And she couldn't even prepare herself for possible dangers because she had no idea where she was supposed to be. Africa? Prehistoric Asia? Some, somewhere completely imaginary? Whoever could dream up a city like that could invent a whole lot of monsters, too. The rattle grew louder. Rini tried to remember the things she had read in books. Most animals, she seemed to remember, were more scared of you than you were of them. Even the big ones, like lions, preferred to avoid humans. Assuming we have anything like real animals here. Dismissing that bleak thought, she decided that rather than crouching in fear, hoping not to be discovered, she would be better off announcing her presence. She took a breath and began singing loudly. Genome warriors, brave and strong, battle mutas, evil throng, separate the right from wrong, mighty genome warriors. It was embarrassing, but at the moment, the children's show theme, one of Stephen's great favorites, was the only thing that came to her mind. When the mutant mastermind threatens all of humankind, tries to sneak up from behind and cut genetic ties that bind. The rustling grew louder. Rini broke off her song and raised the club. A shaggy, strange-looking animal, somewhere between a rat and a pig in appearance, and closer in size to the latter, pushed through into the clearing. Rini froze. The thing really, the thing raised its snout for a moment and sniffed, but did not seem to see her. A moment later, two smaller versions of the original bumbled out of the vegetation behind it. The mother made a quiet grunting noise and herded her offspring back into the, sh into the shrubbery, leaving Rini shaken but relieved. The creature had looked vaguely familiar, but she certainly could not say she had recognized it. She still did not have any idea where she was supposed to be. Genome warriors, she sang again, louder this time. Apparently, at least judging by the pig rat, or whatever it was she had just met, the local fauna weren't aware that they were supposed to be afraid of humans. Bold and clean, with chromosomes so sharp and keen, they'd fight the mutomix machine, mighty genome warriors. The moon had passed directly above her, and she had run through every song she could remember, pop tunes, themes from various net shows, nursery rhymes, and tribal hymns, when she thought she heard a faint voice calling her name. She stood, about to shout a reply, but stopped. She was no longer in her own world. She was very evidently trapped in someone else's dream, and she could not shake off the memory of the dark something that had killed Singh and handled Rini herself as though she were a toy. 
Perhaps this strange operating system, or whatever it was, had lost her when she slipped through, but was now looking for her. It sounded ridiculous, but the horrible living darkness, followed by the overpowering realness of this place, had shaken her badly. Before she could decide what to do, something decided for her. The leaves rattled overhead, then something thumped down onto the floor of the clearing. The intruder had a head like a dog and yellow moon-reflecting eyes. Rini tried to scream but could not. Choking, she raised the thick branch. The thing skittered backward and lifted surprisingly human forepaws. Rini! It is me! Kabu! Kabu! What is... Is that really you? The baboon settled onto its haunches. I promise you. Do you remember the people who sit on their heels? I am wearing their shape, but behind the shape is me. Oh, my God. There could be no mistaking the voice. Why would anything that could copy Kabu's speech so perfectly bother to send an imposter in such a confusing shape? Oh, my God, it is you. She ran forward and lifted the hairy animal body in her arms and hugged it and wept. But why do you look like that? Is it something that happened when we passed through that, whatever that was? Kabu was using his nimble baboon fingers to apply himself to fire making. By climbing, he had found some dead branches, comparatively dry because they had not yet fallen to the ground. A tiny wisp of smoke was now rising from the piece braced between his long feet. I told you that I had a dream, he said, that it was time for all the first people to join together once more. I dreamed that it was time to repay the debt that my family owes to the people who sit on their heels. For that reason, and others that you would think more practical. I chose this as my secondary sin, after a more ordinary human shape. But when I came through to this place, this was the body I had been given. I cannot find any way to make things change, so even when I did not wish to frighten you, I still had to remain in this form. Rini smiled. Just being reunited with Kabu had lifted her spirits, and the sight of a smoldering red spot in the hollowed-out branch was lifting them higher still. You had practical reasons for choosing that sim. What exactly is practical about being a baboon? Kabu gave her a long look. There was something inherently comical in the bony, overhanging brow and canine snout, but the little man's personality still made itself felt. Many things, Rini. I can get to places you cannot. I was able to climb a tree to find these branches, remember? I have teeth. He briefly bared his impressive fangs. That may be useful. And I can go places and not be remarked upon, because city people do not notice animals, even in a world as strange as this, I would guess. Considering how little we know of this network and its simulations, I think those are all valuable commodities. The curls of leaves had now begun to burn. As Kabu used these small flames to ignite a larger blaze, Rini reached her hands toward the warmth. Have you tried to talk to Jeremiah? Kabu nodded his head. I am sure you and I have made the same discoveries. Rini leaned back. This is all so hard to believe. I mean, it feels incredibly real, doesn't it? Can you imagine if we had direct neural hookups? I wish we did. The baboon squatted, poking at the blaze. It is frustrating not to be able to smell more things. This sim desires nose information. I'm afraid the military didn't think smells were very important. The V-tank equipment has a pretty rudimentary scent palette. They probably just wanted users to be able to smell equipment fires and bad air and a few other things. But beyond that, 
what, what do you mean anyway, knows information? Before entering into VR the first time, I had not realized how much I rely on my sense of smell, really. Also, perhaps because I am wearing an animal sim, the operating system of this network seems to give me slightly different, what words do you use? Sensory input. I feel I could do many things that I could never do in my other life. A brief chill went through Rini at Kabu's mention of an other life, but he distracted her by leaning close and snuffling at her with his long muzzle. The light touch tickled, and she pushed him away. What are you doing? Memorizing your scent, or at least the scent our equipment gives you. If I had better tools, I would not even have to work at it. But now, I think I will be able to find you even if you get lost again. He sounded pleased with himself. Finding me isn't the issue. Finding us, that's the difficult part. Where are we? Where do we go? We have to do something soon. I don't care about hourglasses and imaginary cities, but my brother's dying. I know. We must find a way out of this jungle first, I think. Then we will be able to learn more. He rocked on his haunches, holding his tail in his hand. I think I can tell you something about where we are, though, and when we are, too. You can't. How could you? What did you see before you met up with me? A road sign? A tourist information booth? He furrowed his brow, the very picture of cool simian indignation. It is only a guess I am making, Rini, because there is so much we do not know about this network and its simulations. I, I may be wrong, but part of it is common sense. Look around us. This is a jungle, a rainforest like the Cameroon. But where are the animals? I, I saw a few, and I'm sitting next to one. He ignored this. A few, indeed, and there are not as many birds as you would expect in such a place. So? So, I would guess that we are quite close to the edge of the forest, and that Either there is a big city nearby or some kind of industry. I've seen it before in the real world. Either one of those would have driven many of the animals away. Rini nodded slowly. Kabu was emotionally perceptive, but he was also just plain clever. It had been easy to underestimate him sometimes because of his small stature and the quaintness of his clothes and speech. It would be even easier to make that mistake while he wore his present appearance. Or, if this is an invented world, someone may just have made it that way, she pointed out. Perhaps. But I think there is a good chance we are not far from people. You said when as well. If the animals have been driven away, then I suspect that the technology of this this world is not too far behind our own, or even ahead. Also, there is a harsh scent in the air that I believe is part of this place, and not just an accidental product of our V-tanks. I only smelled it when the wind changed, just before I found you. Rini, enjoying the surprisingly powerful comfort of the fire, was content to play Watson to the small man's homes. And that scent is? I cannot say for certain, but it is smoke more modern than that of a wood fire. I smell metal in it and oil. We'll see. I hope you're right. And if we've got a long search ahead of us, it would be nice if it took place somewhere with hot showers and warm beds. They fell silent, listening to the crackle of the fire. A few birds and something that sounded like a monkey called in the trees above. What about Martine? Rini asked suddenly. Could you use this baboon nose of yours to find her? Perhaps if we were close enough. 
although I do not know what smell she has in this simulation, but there is nothing that smells like you do, which is the only measure I have for a human scent, anywhere nearby. Rini looked past the fire into the darkness. Perhaps if she and Kabu had wound up reasonably close to each other, Martine would not be too far away, if she had survived. Kabu, what did you experience when we were coming through? His description brought back the goose flesh, but told her nothing new. The last thing I heard Mr. Singh say was that it was alive, he finished. Then I had a sense of many other presences, as though I was surrounded by spirits. I woke up in the forest as you did, alone and confused. Do you have any idea what that thing was? The thing that caught us and killed Singh? I can tell you it wasn't like any security program I've ever heard of. It was the All Devourer. He spoke with flat certainty. What are you talking about? It is the thing that hates life because it is itself empty. There is a famous story my people tell of the last days of Grandfather Mantis and how the old devourer came to his campfire. He shook his head. But I will not tell it here, not now. It is an important story, but it is sad and frightening. Well, whatever that thing was, I never want to go near it again. It was worse than that Kali creature in Mr. J's. Although, as she thought about it, there had been certain similarities between the two, especially the way they apparently managed to affect physical changes through virtual media. What connection might there be in could contemplating the Kali and what had happened inside the club help her understand what Kabu called the Owl All Devourer? Could anything help them understand? Rini yawned. It had been a long day. Her brain didn't want to work anymore. She pushed herself back against a tree trunk. At least this tropical simulation wasn't too full of insects. Perhaps she'd actually be able to get some sleep. Kabu, come over here closer, will you? I'm getting tired and I don't know how much longer I can stay awake. He looked at her for a silent moment, then walked on all fours across the small clearing. He crouched beside her for an awkward moment, then stretched out and lay his head across her thighs. She idly stroked his furry neck. I'm glad you're here. I know that you and my father and Jeremiah are really only a few meters away from me, but it still felt terribly lonely when I woke up by myself. It would have been much worse spending the whole night here alone. Kabu did not say anything, but extended one long arm and patted her on the top of the head, then lightly touched her nose with his hairless monkey finger. Rini felt herself drifting into welcome sleep. I can see the edge of the forest, Kabu called twenty meters up, and there is a settlement. Rini paced impatiently at the foot of the tree. Settlement? What? What kind? I cannot tell from here. He walked farther out onto the branch, which swayed in a way that made Rini nervous. It is at least a couple of kilometers away, but there is smoke and buildings, too. They look very simple. He descended swiftly, then dropped to the spongy ground beside her. I have seen what looks like a good path, but the jungle is very thick. I will have to climb up again soon and look for some more, look some more, or we will spend all day tearing our way through. You are enjoying this, aren't you? Just because we happen to wind up in a jungle, your baboon idea looks brilliant. But what if we'd wound up in the middle of an office building or something? Come along. We have been in this place most of a day already. He loped away. Rini followed a little more slowly, cursing the thick vegetation. 
Some path, she thought. They stood sheltering in the darkness of the forest's edge. Before them lay a descending slope of reddish mud, pimpled with the stumps of cut trees and scarred with the ruts of their removal. It's a logging camp, Rini whispered. It looks modern, sort of. A number of large vehicles were parked in the cleared area below. Small shapes moved among them, cleaning and adjusting them like mahouts tending elephants. The machinery was large and impressive, but from what Rini could see there were odd anachronisms as well. None of them had the tank-like treads she was accustomed to seeing on heavy construction equipment. Instead, they had fat wheels covered with studs. Several of them also seemed to be, power seemed to be powered by steam boilers. The row of huts beyond, however, clearly made from some prefabricated material, were indistinguishable from things she had seen on the outskirts of Durban. In fact, she knew people, some of them students of hers, who had lived their whole lives in such huts. Just remember, stay close to me, she said. We don't know how they feel about wild animals here, but if you hold my hand, they'll probably accept that you're a pet. Kabu was becoming quite adept at using the baboon face. His, ex his expression clearly said that she should enjoy this small reversal of fortune while she could. As they made their way down the slippery hillside beneath the gray morning sky, Rini, for the first time, had a view of the countryside. Beyond the camp, a wide dirt road cut through the jungle. <clears throat> the land around it was largely flat. Rising mist obscured the horizon and made the trees seem to stretch endlessly. The camp's inhabitants were dark-skinned, but not as dark as she was, and most that she could see had straight black hair. Their clothing gave no clues as to time or place, since most of them wore only pants, and their choice of footgear was hidden by red mud. One of the nearest workers spotted her and shouted something to the others. Many turned to stare. Take my hand, she whispered to Kabu. Remember, baboons don't talk in most places. One of the workmen had rambled off, perhaps to alert the authorities, or maybe to get weapons, Rini thought. How isolated was this place? What did it mean to be an unarmed woman in such a situation? It was frustrating to have so little knowledge, like being transported by surprise to another solar system and dumped off the starship with nothing but a picnic basket. A silent half-circle of workers formed as Rini and Kabu approached, but remained at a distance that might have been respectful or superstitious. Rini stared boldly back at them. The men were mostly small and wiry, their features vaguely Asian, like pictures she remembered of the Mongols of steppe country. Some of them wore bracelets of a translucent jade-like stone, or wore amulets of metal and mud-draggled feathers on thongs around their necks. A man wearing a shirt and a wide-brimmed conical straw hat bustled up from behind the gathering crowd of workers. He was thickly muscled with a long, sharp nose and had a paunch that hung over his colorful belt. Rini guessed he must be the foreman. Do you speak English? she asked. He paused, looked her up and down, then shook his head. No? What is it? Rini's confusion passed in a moment. Apparently the simulation had built-in translation facilities, so she seemed to be speaking the foreman's language, and he, hers. As she continued the conversation, she saw that his mouth movements did not quite match his words, confirming her guess. She also noticed that he had a pierced lower lip with a small gold plug in it. I am sorry. We... I am lost. I have had an accident. Inwardly, she cursed. In all the time they had spent struggling through the jungle, she had given no thought to a cover story. She decided to wing it. I was with a group of hikers, but I got separated from them. Now she just had to hope the custom of walking for pleasure existed in this place. Apparently, it did. 
You are far from any towns, he said, looking at her with a certain shrewd good humor, as though he guessed she hadn't told him the truth, but wasn't too bothered about it. Still, it is bad to be lost and far from home. My name is Tok. Come with me. As they walked across the encampment, Kabu, still silent at Rini's side, uncommented upon, despite all the stares he received, she tried to get a better fix on what sort of place this was. The foreman looked as Asiatic or Middle Eastern as any of the laborers. On his belt was something that looked like a field telephone. It had a short antenna, but was cylindrical and covered with carvings. Something that very much resembled a satellite dish also stood atop one of the larger huts. It didn't add up to any recognizable pattern. The satellite hut proved to be Tok's office and home. He sat Rini down in a chair in front of his metal desk and offered her a cup of something that did not fully translate, which she accepted. Kabu crouched beside her seat, wide-eyed. The room in which they sat offered no more definitive clues. There were a few books on a shelf, but the writing on their spines was in strange glyphs she could not read. Apparently, the translation algorithm served only for speech. There was also a shrine of some sort, a box-like affair with a frame of colorful feathers, which contained several small wooden figures of people with animal heads. I can't figure this place out at all, she whispered. Kabu's small fingers squeezed her hand, warning her that the foreman was returning. Rini thanked him as she took the steaming cup, then lifted it to her face and sniffed it, before remembering that, as Kabu had complained, the V-tank gave her a very limited sense of smell. But the mere fact that she had tried to smell it suggested that this place was already impairing her VR reflexes. If she didn't stay vigilant, she could easily forget that it wasn't real. She had to lift the cup carefully. She had to lift the cup carefully, feeling for her lips to make sure she was placing it properly, since her mouth was the one spot where she had no sensitivity. It was like trying to drink after having been anesthetized at the dentist's office. What sort of monkey is that? Tok squinted at Kabu. I have not seen one like it before. I don't know. It was given to me by a friend who, who traveled a lot. It is a very faithful pet. <coughs> Tok nodded. Rini was relieved to see that the word seemed to translate. How long have you been lost? He asked. Rini decided to stick close to the truth, which always made lying easier. I spent one night in the jungle by myself. How many? How many of you were there? She hesitated, but her course had been set. There were two of us, not including my pet monkey, who got separated from the rest. And then I lost her as well. He nodded again, as though this jibed with some personal calculation. And you are a Temeluni, of course. This was slightly deeper water, but Rini took a chance. Yes, of course. She waited, but this also seemed to confirm the foreman's casual suspicions. You people, you townsfolk, you think you can just walk in the jungle like it was some name she could not quite grasp, Park. But the wild places are not like that. You should be more careful with your life and health. Still, the gods are sometimes good to fools and wanderers. He looked upward, then muttered something and made a sign on his breast. I will show you something. Come. He stood up and walked around the desk, beckoning Rini toward the door at the back of the office. On the other side was the foreman's living quarters, with a table, a chair, and a bed, canopied by a curtain of mosquito netting. As he stepped toward the bed and pulled back the gauzy netting, Rini braced herself against the wall, wondering if he was expecting some kind of exchange of favors for her rescue. But there was already someone there. The sleeping woman was small and dark-haired and long-nosed like Tok, dressed in a simple white cotton dress. Rini did not recognize her. 
As she stood, frozen, unsure of what to do, Kabu loped to the bed and jumped up beside the woman, then began to bounce up and down on the thin mattress. He was clearly trying to tell her something, but it took her a long moment to understand. Martine? She hurried forward. The woman's eyes fluttered open, the pupils roving, unfixed. The way! Blocked! Martine, if this was her, lifted her hands as though to ward off some looming danger. The voice was not familiar and there was no French accent, but the next words dispelled any doubt. No! No, sing! Do not! Ah, oh my God, how terrible! Rini's eyes stung with tears as she watched her companion thrashing on the bed, apparently still in the grip of the nightmare that had awaited them at Otherland's shadowy border. Oh, Martine! She turned to the foreman who was watching the reunion with grave self-satisfaction. Where did you find her? Talk explained that a party of tree markers had discovered her wandering dazedly at the edge of the jungle, a short distance from the camp. The men are superstitious, he said. They think her touched by the gods. Again, the reflexive gesture. But I suspected that it was hunger and cold and fear. Perhaps even a blow on the head. The foreman returned to his work, promising that they could have a ride back with the next convoy of logs leaving at twilight. Rini, overwhelmed by events, neglected to ask where back might be. She and Kabu spent the dwindling afternoon sitting beside the bed, holding Martine's hands and speaking soft words to her when the nightmares seemed to pursue her too closely. Wow, we're still not in focus, are we? Who knows? The foreman talk helped Rini up into the back of the huge, gleaming, steam-powered truck. Kabu clambered up by himself and sat next to her atop the chained logs. Talk made her promise that she and her mad Temeluni friends would not wander around in the wild country anymore. She did, and thanked him for his kindness as the convoy pulled out of the camp and onto the broad, muddy road. Rini could have ridden in one of the other truck cabs, but she wanted the privacy to talk to Kabu. Also, Martine was belted into the passenger seat of this truck, whose driver, Rini had noticed with interest, was a broad-faced, broad-shouldered woman, and Rini wanted to stay close to their ill companion. So, that's not Martine's voice because she's delirious and she's speaking French, I suppose, she said as they bumped out of camp. But why do you have your voice and I have mine? I mean, you sound like you, even though you look like something out of a zoo. Kabu, who was standing upright, leaning into the wind and sniffing, did not answer. We must all have been piggybacked on Singh's index, she reasoned. And that index was marked English-speaking. Of course, that doesn't explain why I kept this body, but you got your second choice, Sim. She looked down at her own copper-skinned hands. Just as Kabu had wound up with a good body for jungle wandering, she had chosen one that seemed physically very close to the local human norm. Of course, if they had landed in a Viking village or in World War II Berlin, she wouldn't have fit in quite so well. Kabu clambered down and crouched beside her again, his erect tail curved like a strung bow. We have found Martine, but we still do not know what we are searching for, he said, or where we are going. Rini looked out at the miles of thick green jungle lying behind them in the dying light, and the miles that the strip of red road still had to cross. You had to remind me, didn't you? They drove through the night. The temperature was tropical, but Rini soon learned that virtual logs made no better a bed than real ones. What was particularly annoying was knowing that her real body was floating in a V-tank full of adjustable gel, which could have been made to simulate the softest goose down if she could only work the controls. As the sun came up, Ending a darkness that had brought Rini very little rest, the trucks reached a town. 
It was apparently the home of the sawmill and processing facilities and something of a jungle metropolis. Even at first light, there were scores of people on the muddy streets. A handful of Land Rover-like cars rolled past as they drove down the wide main thoroughfare, some clearly powered by steam, others more mysteriously. Rini also spotted more of the objects that looked like satellite dishes, which seemed restricted to the largest buildings, but in many other ways the town looked as though it might have been transplanted whole from the set of some saga of the American West. The wooden sidewalks were raised above the clinging muck, the long, town-bisecting main street seemed designed for gunfights, and there were as many horses as cars. A few men even seemed to be having an early morning brawl outside one of the local taverns. These men, and the other people Rini could see, were better dressed than the jungle workers, but except for the fact that many wore shawls of brightly dyed woven wool, she still could not put her finger on anything definitive in their clothing styles. The trucks rattled through town and lined up on the vast mud flat outside the sawmill. The driver of Rini's truck got out and, with a certain taciturn courtesy, suggested she and her sick friend and their pet monkey might as well stop here. As she helped Rini unload the semi conscious Martine from the cab, the driver suggested they could find a bus in front of the town hall. Rini was relieved to know there was somewhere else beyond this place. A bus! That's wonderful! But we, uh, I don't have any money. The truck driver stared at her. You need money for city buses now? She said at last. By all the lords of heaven, what shit will the council think of next? The god king ought to execute them all and start over. As the driver's surprise had suggested, the buses were apparently free. Rini, with surreptitious assistance from Kabu, was able to help Martine stumble the short distance to the town hall, where they took a seat on the steps to wait. The French woman still seemed to be caught in those terrible moments when they had broken into the other land system and everything had gone so badly wrong, but she was able to move around almost normally when prompted, and once or twice Rini even felt a returned pressure when she squeezed Martine's hand, as though something inside was struggling toward the surface. I hope so, Rini thought. Without seeing, she's the only hope we've got of making any sense of this. She looked out at the utterly foreign yet utterly realistic surroundings and felt almost ill. Who am I kidding? Look at this place. Think of the sort of mines and money and facilities it took to make this. And... We are going to put the ringleaders under citizen's arrest or something? This whole venture was ridiculous from the very beginning. The sensation of helplessness was so powerful that Rini could not summon the will to speak. She, Kabu, and Martine sat on the steps in silence, an oddly assorted trio that received its due in the covert stares and whispers of the local populace. I see that my mother-in-law checked in. Hi, Hazel. Good to see you. Rini thought the jungle might be thinning a little, but she wasn't positive. After watching an uncountable number of trees go by, hour upon hour, she was seeing the monstrous landscape, monotonous landscape, slide past even when she closed her eyes. The gold-toothed, feather-medallion-bedecked bus driver had not batted an eye at her two unusual companions, but when Rini had asked him where the bus went, whatever information was printed over the windscreen was illegible to her, like the foreman's books, he had stared as though she had asked him to make the battered old vehicle fly. Temeloon, good woman, he had said, lowering his chunky sunglasses to examine her more closely, perhaps thinking that someone might ask him later to describe the escaped madwoman. The city of the god king, praise to his name. The Lord of life and death, he who is favored above all others, where else would it go? He gestured to the single straight road leading out of the sawmill town. Where else could it go? Now, with Kabu standing in her lap, his hands pressed against the window, and Martine sleeping against her shoulder, 
Rini tried to make sense of all she had learned. The place seemed to have 19th and 20th century technologies mixed up together, so far as she could remember the differences between the two. The people looked something like Asians or Middle Easterners, although she had seen a few in the town who had fairer or darker appearances. The foreman hadn't heard of English, so that might indicate a great distance from the English-speaking peoples, or a world in which there was no English at all, or just that the foreman was ignorant. They seemed to have at least one well-established religion and a god-king, but was that a person or a figure of speech? And the truck driver had made it sound as if there were some kind of governing council. Rini sighed miserably. Not much to go on at all. They were wasting time, precious, precious time, but she couldn't think of a single thing they could do differently. Now they were headed to Temelun, which apparently was an even larger town. And if nothing there brought them closer to their goal, then what? On to the next? Was this foray for which Singh had paid with his life going to be just bus trip after bus trip? One long, bad holiday? Kabu turned from the window and put his head next to her ear. He had been quiet during the journey so far, since there were passengers crammed into every possible space. Sorry, I lost it for, for a second here. Where did it go? Since there were passengers crammed into every possible space, on all the seats and in the aisles, half a dozen at least, just within a meter radius of Rini's cramped seat, many of these passengers were also transporting chickens or small animals Rini couldn't quite identify, which explained the bus driver's disinterest in Kabu. But none of these creatures showed any inclination to talk, which was why the baboon in Rini's lap now whispered very quietly. I have been thinking and thinking what we must look for, he said. If we are seeking the people who own this other land network, then we first must discover something of who wields the power in this world. And how do we do that? Rini murmured. Go to a library? I suppose they must have them, but we'll probably have to find a pretty large town. Kabu spoke a bit louder because the woman seated in front of them had begun singing a wordless chant that reminded Rini a little of the tribal odes her father and his friends sometimes sang when the beer had been flowing freely. Or perhaps we will have to befriend someone who can tell us what we need to know. Rini looked around, but no one was paying attention to either of them. Beyond the windows she could see cleared farming land and a few houses, and thought they must be drawing close to the next town. But how can we trust anyone? I mean, any single person on this bus could be wired right into the operating system. They're not real, Kabu. Most of them can't be anyway. His reply was interrupted. By the way, I'm going to go probably about two minutes past here to get to a break. His reply was interrupted by a pressure on her arm. Martine was leaning toward her, clutching as though to save herself from falling. Her Sim's eyes still wandered, unfocused, but the face showed a new alertness. Martine? It's Rini. Can you hear me? The darkness is very, very thick. She sounded like a lost child, but for the first time the voice was recognizably hers. You are safe, Rini whispered urgently. We've come through. We are in the Otherland network. The face turned, but the eyes did not make contact. Rini? Yes, it's me. And Kabu's here too. Did you understand what I just said? We've come through. We are in. Martine's grip did not slacken, but the look of anxiety on her bony face stiffened, softened. So much. She said, there is so much. She struggled to collect herself. There has been much darkness. Ab Kabu was squeezing Rini's other arm. She was beginning to feel like the mother of too many children. Can't you see us, Martin? Your eyes aren't focusing. 
The woman's face went slack for a moment, as, she, as if she had been dealt an unexpected blow. I... Something has happened to me. I am not yet myself. She turned her face toward Rini. Tell me what has happened to Singh. He's dead, Martin. Whatever that thing was, it got him. I... I swear I felt it kill him. Martine shook her head miserably. Me also. I had hoped I dreamt it. Kabu was squeezing harder. Rini reached down to lift his hand away, but saw that he was staring out the window. Kabu? Look, Rini, look! He did not whisper. A moment later, she too forgot her caution. The bus had turned in a wide bend, and for the first time she could see a horizon beyond the trees. A flat band of silver lay along the distant skyline, a span of shivering reflection which could only be water, a bay or an ocean by the size of it. But it was what lay before it, silhouetted against its metallic sheen in complicated arcs and needles, glittering in the afternoon sun like the largest amusement park that ever was, that had riveted the disguised bushman and now brought Rini halfway out of her seat. Oh, she breathed. Oh, look! Martine stirred impatiently. What is it? It's the city, the golden city. And that's where we're going to stop. I'm wondering if maybe I have the mic turned up too high and we're picking up extra volume because of that. I don't know. We'll try it next time. We'll see what we can do. Um, may just be my computer, my poor laptop, which I inherited from my wife and gave her mine. Um, <coughs> I got her old laptop and she got my new one. I hope my mother-in-law is listening to what a kind husband I am. Anyway, maybe it's my poor old laptop is having problems with all of this modern technology. But what I am going to say at this point is um, thank you so much for joining me. I'm going to make this short because it's well after 2 o'clock my time here. And I know most of you got things to do, places to be, people to be. So thank you very much for joining me. Take good care of yourselves, your friends, neighbors, family, loved ones, everybody. Um, I will see you very, very soon um, tomorrow night for some of you, for most of you next week at the same time or however it works out for you. Or I'll see you when you re-watch re this or watch this as a part of a recorded thing or whatever. It doesn't matter. It's all the same. Time shifted on time. Doesn't matter. Thank you for bearing with me. Sorry for any technical issues that there were. Um, and I'll see you real soon. So... Bye. Be good. Ciao.